All right, good morning. We are a little light this morning. <clears throat> Folks are probably on vacation or something, right? Good to see you this morning. I'm going to go ahead and have a word of prayer and, uh, and get started as folks are still coming in. Let's pray together. Father God, we're thankful again for this day in which you have made. Let us rejoice, be glad in it, Lord God. And we're grateful to be able to come to this place to think about you and your word and sharing your word with others and Worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord God. We <clears throat> are so grateful for that privilege. We're thankful for all that are teaching this, this morning, Lord God, and, and those who are here to, to learn and to grow. We're so grateful for your son and the church that he established. And we just pray for all of the churches of Christ around the world this morning, Lord God. And that you help us to stay strong and faithful in this, in this difficult time, especially be with those who are in war-torn countries, Lord God, and especially uh, Ukraine. And we have brethren in, in Russia and, and all over the world, Lord God, and we just pray that you be with them, keep them strong, keep them sharing your word, from faithful until death, Lord God, and we just pray that your healing hand be upon those of our number who are going through difficult health um, situations, and we're thankful for Charles and his um, progress and his recovery, and pray that you continue to bless him and, and all those who have gone through uh, surgeries and <clears throat> procedures recently, Lord God, and Continue to uh, watch over us. We're thankful again for your son and the salvation that we have. And um, continue to forgive us when we fall short. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so I have um, a couple things to tell you about this morning. One is that um, I got news of a couple studies that are going on. Uh, taking place. Can't tell you a lot about the details right now, but uh, just know that uh, there are folks sharing the gospel with people, you know, uh, in, in, in our, uh, within our number here. So that's a really good thing. <clears throat> also, we never know when God... Um, will place somebody in your path. And this happened to me last week on Monday. I had Monday and Tuesday off of last week. And, um, you know, when we open ourselves up to wanting to win souls for Christ or wanting to talk to people, God will place people in our path. And it's not necessarily the people that we're praying for, right? Um, and so... He did this with me on Monday. So my neighbor across the street <clears throat> goes to the uh, Calvary Church on um, um, Pineville Matthews Road in Charlotte. Huge building, looks like a crown, right? We're all familiar with it. And uh, so when we moved in 15 years ago, we got to talking very friendly and found out he went there and he found out, you know, I, I was going here and... Um, and then his son had this project for the church where he had to go throughout the neighborhood and try to get people to come over. And it was, had something to do with their website. They wanted people to go to their website and stuff like that. So, you know, Aaron and I were, were, were home, I think at the time we said, yeah, sure, we'll come over. And so we went over, um, and, and, you know, viewed the presentation and everything. And I, and I had a copy of my book at the time. 
right? And I, you know, I kind of knew where he was, you know, spiritually as far as if he's attending there, he's most likely a faith only, you know, uh, believer, what have you. And as we've talked, <clears throat> found out that that was indeed the case. So I brought my book with me. And after the presentation, you know, we, we chatted for a little bit. And I said, hey, here's a copy of a book that I wrote. You know, why don't you check it out? Um, and so he, he must have read it because he didn't speak to me for about two years after that. <laughs> We'd be out. I'd say hi. He'd give me a quick wave and, you know, walking back and forth with his grandkids. Didn't even look over, you know, just not a word. And so, and, you know, and that was, that was years ago. So Monday, I'm out in the yard again, and, and, and it, it took some time, but eventually, you know, he started speaking to me again, and, and you know, we, we were friendly and what have you. But Monday, he comes over and he says, hey, um, I just recently retired, and I'm like, congratulations, that's great. And he says, you know, we're writing, uh, we're, we're checking off one of our bucket list items, and we're going to Hawaii. For vacation and I was like fantastic you know congratulations and he said uh, do you mind we're gonna have our mail stop but our you know the mailman isn't always the best so uh, can you just check our mail occasionally and if there's stuff piling up just you know grab it for us and I said sure absolutely and so you know he talked we were talking about retirement and he says you know well the most important retirement is you know getting to heaven you know that's 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 what that's you know that's what I'm mainly concerned about. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm on the same page with you there. Um, and he starts talking about this whole, um, the new heaven and the new earth, right? That whole concept of the new heaven and the new earth. And uh, so, you know, I kind of let him, you know, talk about, his viewpoint on it, it was interesting. You know, he talked about how when Jesus was resurrected, he was in a physical body. And so he feels like, you know, the new heaven and the new earth is going to be a new earth, a new heaven, right? Um, where there is no sin. And, uh, he, you know, he, he was talking about a book that he was reading. And, and um, so, you know, I, I, I just asked him some questions. I didn't, you know, try to get into an argument with him or anything. I just asked him some questions. I said, well, you know, what about when Jesus said, like, you know, my, my kingdom is not of this world, you know? And he's like, yeah, well, not this world, but it's going to be the new world. I said, okay, all right. Um, what about, like, First Thessalonians where, you know, it says that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are, um, remain will go to meet Jesus Christ in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord, you know. And uh, he's, you know, he's like, well, yeah, we'll be with him wherever he is and he'll be here. And I was like, okay, well, you know, and so we were just kind of discussing this. And I wasn't, you know, sh trying to shoot him down. I was just asking questions, right? Throwing a couple of verses out there. And, uh, and so I, I said, well, give me the guy's name. Of, of the text it to me, text me, you know, the name of the book and, and the author, because I know I'm going to forget it. And he's like, sure, I'll, you know, we, you know, we adding to each other's numbers. So he's out, text it to you, which he did later. So, you know, I'm, you know, again, I'm not getting, being argumentative. I'm receiving what he's saying. Right. And um, so I said, well, let me share something with you that I think we've discussed before in the past. I said, what about baptism? And uh, I said, you know, Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, whoever believes and what? Is baptized shall be saved. And, and I said, and the saved came after the baptism, right? I said, Acts 2, 38, when the Jews, you know, um, crucified Christ, Peter said, you know, repent and, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Right. And I said, um, and I just started, I was just going from one verse to the next. Right. I said, the Ethiopian eunuch, what about him? You know, it says Philip just preached unto him, Jesus. And when he saw water, he said, what should hinder me from being baptized? Right. And uh, so I said, so we can't be, we can't get into heaven without our sins being forgiven. Right. 
And he's like, right. And, uh, and he says, well, but, but, you know, he said, you know, where I go to church, you know, we see that as just an outward showing of your faith after you've already been saved and you should be baptized. And he said, my wife and I have been baptized. And I was like, great, fantastic. And, uh, but I said, what about the, you know, the, you know, the, then I mentioned Paul. I said, okay, so Paul on the road to Damascus, a lot of people say that, you know, that's when he was converted. But how about when he got to Damascus and Ananias came to him and said, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Right. And he said, um, so I'm trying to think of the. So, so that, I think that's when he said, well, yeah, you know, we should do it as an outward sign of, of you know, inward grace or what have you. And then that's when I said, that's exactly how I used to think. But then a friend of mine showed me a, a verse and I told him, I was saying how I told my friend, and this is Greg who, you know, you've met. You'll never be able to convince me that baptism is going to save me. And you can't show me a verse that says baptism saves me in the Bible. And then I, then I quoted my, my sermon verse. Right? 1 Peter 3.21, which says, that some translations say we have an antitype that now saves us baptism, or some verses say baptism now saves us. Right? And guess what he said after that? Where's that verse again, he said? He said, where's that verse again? I said, 1 Peter 3.21. Check it out. So it's not on our timing, right? But God knew my heart was open to want to share. And I knew the verses. And so and, I, and I, I've been praying for God to prepare other people's hearts, let, let alone that I know he might be preparing my neighbor's heart. And he brings my neighbor over. And this is all about what we've been talking about, being ready to give an answer for the hope that's within you. Right? And I was ready. And I want you all to be ready. Because this is a real life occurrence. This isn't the, the, the story I'm telling here. This is something that actually happened and it can happen to you and it's happening to some of you in the congregation already. Sharing what you know from the Bible with others. Joe? You're talking about there, it's so very true. Back when I was a very young guy on there, the minister told me- well, That was a long time ago. ago. No, I'm just kidding. It was a long time ago, 50 something years ago. <laughs> uh, he told me, he says, to do personal work. He says, I don't follow these written scripts and all very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me, he says, first, when you talk to somebody and they show some interest, I'll find out what they believe in and what you do. And says, here's some points that we don't agree upon. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about those. Yeah, and, exactly. And go in that direction. I've had much more success over the years yeah. in doing that on there uh, by doing it that exact way. Other than trying to take up and say and take the like I did when I was 24 years old, try to cram a program into somebody's right, life right there. Uh, and, and 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 what you're saying it works. Just the other day, a guy does a lot of work for me at the house here. Mm -hmm. uh, he goes to Pentecostal. I, I was talking with him about the Holy Spirit. Well, I've just finished reading a book by Howard Winters, uh, "Work with the Holy Spirit." I says, you know, talking about that. Let me just give you this book. Yeah. I said, I've been reading it, and I, says, I, I said, just remember those. I'm going to tell you different what you believe. Mm. Like, read the scriptures before you make a decision. Right. And there's always a, a little point where you get in there. And I've talked to him a time or two since, and we'll stay, we stay in touch. Yeah. And, uh, but that, that type of thing is the, is the most successful way that I've ever found it works. So uh, you, 
what you would do, and I think it's the, the, the straight, correct way to win confidence. Just, just share what you know and, and, and develop that relationship, right? And, um, you know, you happen to be in a, in a study on the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Hey, here, check out, you know, this book or what have you. Um, yeah, you know, but one thing I realized is that going through this class, you know, the teacher always learns the most, right? I'll get to you in a second, Daniel. Um, but I learned and I realized that I kind of use my book as kind of a crutch to say, here, check this out. And, it may, you know, it has all the verses in there, but I think I accomplished more in like 10 minutes of just talking with him face to face than giving him a book and say, check this out. You know, you know what I mean? Because, I mean, he's right across the street. He's my neighbor. Why can't I just talk to him face to face? And we had a great conversation. We talked about family. We talked about our kids. We talked about how they don't always do what we would like them to do. And, you know, and we related on a lot of different levels. And, and so it was just so much better than just, you know, so I have to be careful with that. Maybe develop that relationship first and then say, here's a chapter in, you know, in my book that you might be interested in. Daniel? Okay. So often it takes so much patience and love because, you know, we, we share a verse with someone and we, we, we get that verse and we expect and want them to get it the first time we share it to them. But sometimes because of where they're coming from, because of their paradigm, because of what their life experiences are, they don't get it the first time. They don't get the second time. They don't get the fifth time. That may be the tenth time when they finally, the light comes on and they see what that scripture says. And you know, we have to have so much patience and love and trying to, to work with folks because we want them to get it so quickly, but sometimes it just takes a lot of time because they just, they just can't see it. And we can't understand why they don't see it, but you know, it just right. takes that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, exactly. We have to be so patient with people because, uh, you know, as you're saying, it may take three, four times seeing that verse for them to actually, for the light bulb to come on and say, oh, yeah, now, now I get it. Jack? I'm just going to reiterate what you said. God's working in the background. Exactly. And you're growing and he's growing. Right. And so, you know, people come back at you. Mm-hmm. They remember what you said. That's right. And Thank after you. he, believe me, when he gets back from his trip, I didn't want to bombard him while he's in Hawaii uh, thinking about, you know, baptism or what have you. But when he gets back, uh, we will have some more discussions. So keep, keep him in prayer. All right, um, so back to our homework and our process, right? Continue to pray for these folks. Pray for your own courage. Um, reach out five minutes of fishing a week, you know, things of that nature, okay? All right, so we were talking about persuading others, and we saw how it operates on three levels, right? We talk about the mind, the intellect, um, we're going to look at the emotions this morning, okay? So, um, I went back into the office, and um, I was talking to some friends there that I hadn't seen in a while, and one of them, I was telling Leela about this, and, and one of them is an editor, and she says, oh, an editor, what's an editor do uh, at, you know, at ESPN? And, and I said, well, they edit pieces, um, teases, or, you know, um, videos that talk about a certain player and they're so important because when you're about to watch the game and you get this background piece on a player and it talks about his mother having cancer and you know him being brought up with you know single family and and you know all that he suffered to go through and now he's like this amazing football player it gets you emotionally what into the invested right into that player and now you want to see him do really well so it, it it draws you into wanting to watch the game right and so it tugs on your what your emotions exactly tugs on your emotions teddy bridgewater is he still the, the, the quarterback for the panthers no, it got shipped off to somewhere else. 
that was the case with him when he was in college. They did a piece on him. And, and, and that was the situation with his mother had breast cancer, broken home, brought up very poor. Now, you know, and so, and so I watched him as he went from college to the pros, played for the Panthers for a little bit, you know, making millions of dollars now. He's able to take care of his, of his family. And, and so it's just those, those pieces, those, you know, video edits that draw you in. So we have to be able to connect with people sometimes on an emotional level in order to draw them in to wanting to obey the gospel. You know, what's going on in your life? You know, what needs to be better? Ultimately, do you have the forgiveness of your sins? Have you committed a sin? You know, all have sinned and fallen short, right? We talked about that. And, then, and, you know, just drawing them in to their emotions being a part of this decision, right? Familiarity um, breeds compassion, empathy. If we can empathize with them on a certain level um, and have compassion for that, or if we can relate. You know, somebody came to me recently and said, you know, there's a woman that uh, we have, you know, someone studying with, and she has a, a, a Pentecostal background, okay? Um, so we're thinking of partnering, you know, bringing her uh, with you because you have that background, right? So if we have someone that we know that, that can relate to that person in a certain way, connect them, you know, say, hey. Let's, let's bring so-and-so in because, you know, they have, or they've experienced this. You know, something's going on with somebody in their family, and they've experienced it. Hey, let's bring them in and, and let them talk to this person, you know, and make that connection and, uh, and you know, approach it on an emotional level. All right? So the mind, the emotions, and the will, that's the most important one, right? So... Because the will causes them to act upon what they've learned, what they understand intellectually, um, what they have a deep desire to obey from the heart emotionally, and now they make that decision, right? So the question then for them is, will they align their will with that of Jesus? And many of us who have made that same decision, right? What did Jesus say when he was about to suffer the cross? Not my will. He had his own will to do whatever he wanted to do. Every person has that. That's a gift. Maybe sometimes people see it as a curse. But <laughs> you know, it's like, just God, just make me do what you want me to do. Well, you know, we have to decide to do it. And, um, and so we have our will. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. And so we have to try to bring them to that point where they want to do God's will and not their own. Okay? All right, Jesus said that love is the highest motive for obedience and, and being able to persuade people. Um, John 13, 34, Jesus, you know, you know that passage. He said, they will know that you are my disciples by what? By the love that we have for each other, right? So that's the first thing. It begins with us, right? That's the first thing. By the love we have for each other, they see that love. They see how we're taking care of each other. Um, and then, then love your neighbor as yourself, right? We talked about that a little bit. You can't love your neighbor unless you love yourself. And if you have a problem with loving yourself, then, you know, we, we can help you with that. But you need to get that under wraps first. Um, and then James writes, you know, that uh, faith without action or faith without works is what? Dead. Just as the body without the spirit is dead. So faith without works or faith without action is dead. Like you're just laying there in the funeral and in the coffin. That's your faith. If you're not putting it into work, into action, okay? 
Um, so faith acts, faith works, faith does things um, to try to grow as a Christian, grow in your knowledge, grow in your ability to share the gospel, okay? And, uh, and love is obedient. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? It's obedient. You know, um, the fear, is, the scripture says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? The fear of the Lord. And we, and we, we look at that and we, we realize that it's, yeah, it's a little bit of, of, of fear and, and being afraid, but it's more about what? When you, when you, if you have children, you want your children to do what? Respect you. And, and a little fear is helpful. Um, but you establish that early, right? You might spank them a little bit when they're, when they're younger. And they establish that, that fear, but it's more so of a respect. And it grows to more respect as they get older, right? And they realize, you know, thank you for disciplining me when I was younger because now I see all my friends and I remember the boy saying this I see all my friends going through all this stuff and I don't have to worry about it because I'm more disciplined than they are you know kind of thing so but it's the respect that um, love is obedient and respectful okay all right let the word do the work this is an analogy I got from the book that we're using but anybody here, raise your hand if you've done woodworking, wood shop, or if you like to do woodworking. Right. <clears throat> I like it. I like working with my hands. You know, I'm a creative person. I had wood shop when I was in, in, in high school. Haven't done a whole lot of it. I did, I did some stuff on our house um, up in Connecticut, you know, did put some crown molding in and things of that nature. Um, so I like working with wood. So I understand the analogy. When you're and because I've done this, I've made this mistake. When you're, you're using, you know, a bandsaw, or not a bandsaw, or uh, what do you call it? Uh, not a miter saw. Just a saw, uh, that circular saw. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Where you're, you're cutting a big sheet of wood and you, you, you score the line and you just you want to go right up that line with it. Because, you know, maybe if I was doing it myself and I wanted to get it done quickly and I wasn't sure whether, you know, I could hold the board or whatever, I would try to push that blade through there as fast as I could, right? And it would, it would stop, it would get all, you know, and I'd, the, I'd start to go off the line. And what are you supposed to do? Just let, let the blade do the work. <laughs> Let the saw do the cutting, right? And you just give it a little bit of a push, and it'll go right down that line, and it'll do exactly what you want it to do. It'll cut a very smooth, straight cut because the, the saw, the blade, does the work. You don't, you don't have to do the work. That's why it's called an electrical you know, tool. I mean, that's, that, that's why they made it that way, right? And, and that's where it comes to the word. Just let the word do the work. It's not about you. It's not about your ability. Right? You may have, you know, be one of the greatest orators in, in the world, and you could be saying false things, and you're, you're no benefit to anyone. But if you're using the truth of God's word, and, and, and just use that and let the word do the work because it's sharper than a two-edged sword, right? Able to cut the heart. What did those Jews say in Acts chapter 2? That the word did what to their heart? Pricked their heart, right? The word was working on their heart. The truth was working on their heart. Peter had preached the first sermon about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that sermon pricked their heart. It wasn't the fact that, you know, they were these amazing speakers. It was the word, Daniel. Well, there's different types of soil. We're just there sowing the seed. And there's a different type of soil. And if it's the, if it's the right soil the word falls on, 
It's going to react. The parable of the sower, right? Yeah. It's, it's, we're sowing the same seed. And it says in that parable that the seed is what? The word of God, right? It's the same seed. We're sowing the seed, right? And God is doing the work. And where's the seed come from in the, from the first place? From God, right? That's why it's so important not to say, I think, blah, 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 blah. I think, blah, 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 blah. That's why it's so important to know the word and say, well, what about Acts 2.38? What about 1 Peter 3.21, right? Use the word. That's where the power is. Okay? Um, <clears throat> all right. Convert, converting the soul to Jesus not to self. You know, a lot of folks will follow a preacher because he's so dynamic and such a great speaker. And when that preacher leaves or that preacher goes somewhere else, guess where they go? With the preacher. Right? And if they can't go with the preacher, sometimes they don't go anywhere. It's not about the preacher. Did the preacher die for you? Did the preacher write this book? No, no, no. He's just a servant. It's about this book. It's about Jesus. I remember um, Brother Matthews up in um, Jersey. He was doing a gospel meeting one time. And Lila and I, we always uh, laugh about it because he had this little squeaky voice. Um, but, you know, he was talking about denominationalism. And he was saying that, you know, it's not about this speaker or this guy. Like Paul said, in, you know, in 1 Corinthians, you know, you, Apollos and you're following Cephas and, and some, you know, Christ. You know, Christ is not divided. But he would say, this book's about Jesus. In a little squeaky voice. <laughs> but that's who it's about. It's about Jesus. Not about us. Or anybody else. Um, Let's look at First Thessalonians real quick. We've got a few more minutes here. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 2. Verse 13. <clears throat> For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it. Not as the word of men, but as it is, in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So when you heard from us the word, Paul says, you didn't re you, you realize that it was not simply us speaking our opinions, right? You realize that it was the word of God. Right? As it is in truth. The truth. And that's what we need to focus on when we're talking to folks. Truth versus error. The Bible talks about the spirit of truth and, and the spirit of error. A lot of folks are under the spirit of error. Right? And we have to be careful ourselves not to be under that. And <clears throat> be continually studying and, and knowing the truth. Shirley. Mm -hmm. So we were going down the shelf and looking at versions and whatever. Yeah. And there was one Bible that had a sticker on it, signed by the author. <laughs> <laughs> well, that must be the one. <laughs> <laughs> so the so you're in a bookstore and they're looking you're looking for Bibles and there wasn't Bibles it had a sticker on it that said signed by the author. <laughs> That's a pretty special Bible right there. <laughs> well, I mean, God did put his, uh, his signature to it in, in a sense, but uh, <laughs> that's interesting. That's funny. Um, have you heard of Elevation Church? 
did a little Google search preparing for this lesson. 23 locations in the South Charlotte and just over the border in, in South Carolina as well. 27,000 in attendance because each location has a huge screen and they stream the main preacher who I think is in Ballantyne. And he preaches to those 27,000 people. <clears throat> Very energetic service. Um, I actually have an experience when I don't know if they have um, instrumental music there or not. I'm assuming they do. Some you're nodding, you're nodding your head that they do. Yeah. So, um, so competing with that, young people, you know, some young um, coworkers of mine before COVID. I remember them talking about going there and really enjoying the service. And so, how do we how do we compete with that? I mean, the 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 preacher. His net, work is, net worth is $55 million. This guy's got you know, be gigantic, beautiful mansion of a home. Sure, he does a lot of entertaining there with, with some of the members or what have you. Um, they have some of the top musicians in the world come, do their worship service and stuff. I, I, how do you compete with that? David? We don't. Basically, we stick to the truth. That on that side, the people who are doing entertainment, there's always going to be someone bigger and better. And that, that has really nothing to do with us. Yeah. We just do what we, um, what we read in the Bible. You're right. David's saying we just stick to what we know, what the Bible says. But young people like that entertainment, man. I like entertainment. Right? And, and, and I'm sure he's a, you know, dramatic, dynamic speaker. He's got to be if he's got 27,000 people every week listening to him, to, listening to him speak. He's got to be pretty dynamic. How do we, how do we, and you mentioned it. But Matt, well, we've got to ground uh, our, our young ones in truth mm -hmm. when they're young, put the foundation in them, yeah. so that they become leaders in God's word and in the truth, rather than followers to whatever another leader is saying to them. Thank you. That's why we have these programs and we train them to be good. Train up a child the way should go. Train them when they're young, yeah. so then they become leaders in the right way, and they'll continue with that when they. Get older. Train them when they're young in the truth so that they become leaders, not followers. I love that. I love that. Right, Daniel? They see us following after Jesus and God. And they also know that we care and love, and we're showing the love of God to them as well. Mm -hmm. I'm reading that book that you gave me, by the way. And it's so true that I see a lot of the problem, you know, with this generation coming up. And it's not necessarily their fault, it's the, the parents' fault a lot of times, where they're not being rooted and grounded in the truth, like as you were saying, from home. From home. Not at the church building. From home. I say it over and over again. That Friday night family fellowship devo that we used to have with the boys. Priceless. Priceless. They asked questions. We gave them scriptural answers from the Bible. We rooted and grounded them in the truth on a weekly basis from home. Okay, Jack? This is a byproduct of <coughs> caring about the lost. When you care about the lost, you end up keeping your own life in line. When you care about the lost, you keep your own life in line? Okay. You're, you're teaching people, you feel responsible to teach them properly, so you're studying, 
Yeah. yeah. It, it, it moves. Keeps you in the right path. Right. So if you go through 57 years of being a Christian, you have your ups and downs. The greatest thing that saves you is keeping yourself in line with the message of the gospel. Because you don't want to be a bad example if you're trying to teach them to become a Christian, right? I, I, I love that. Angie? I Right, right. So, so don't speak negatively about other religions or false doctrine, what have you, but just try to give them a positive answer, you know, and, and stay on the positive than the negative. I, I agree with that, too. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Last comment, I think. We're almost out of time. When we worship, we worship in spirit and truth. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been to some of these other churches, being the construction and, and building church buildings and stuff, and I've had an opportunity to talk with people like Stephen <coughs> um, they don't worship in spirit and truth they say they do but they don't it, it's an entertainment factor I don't come to church to be entertained I come to worship God that's what we're here to do Right. Uh, one other thing about Steve I, he's a nice guy I, like I said I've met the guy I've talked to him before but uh, I have a lot of issues with with the way that he has presented himself and the way that he lives his life and, and you know, the big house and everything, the fruits of his labor is what he calls it. He says, it's the fruit of my labor. Mm -hmm. And so there's an issue right there too. It's not his work, it's God's work. And, and, and I think he is clad, clattered on that. They also have a coloring book that they produced for a while. They quit doing it because they got a lot of grief. Mm. This is a coloring book that they give to the kids in the class, and they color. Mm -hmm. So you've you've seen probably over the years a picture of these kids. They're sitting in class, and there's Jesus. They're looking at Jesus. You've probably seen that as a kid. Yeah. Well, the elevation coloring book doesn't have a picture of Jesus. The kids looking at him. They have a picture of Steve Furtick sitting there. The kids looking at the him. Uh. So. That that is the issue that I have. Yeah. There. Yeah. It's it's about. Um, it's not about it's, God. Again, it's, it's focusing on on man. On so man. What happened, so a lot of us don't remember, but we live here in Fort Mill, South Carolina. There was if if you live over there around Waterford, there are remains of the PTL, mm -hmm. which yeah. praise the Lord Club. Yeah. Which is what a lot of which is what it was called. We always call it around here the Pass the Loop Club because <laughs> it was Jim and Tammy Baker. We all know everything about them. And, right, right. And they lived in the big house on, down on uh, Antigua K, down yeah. on the point. But it was, for them, it was, they always said, we're doing this for the glory of God, but it wasn't mm. for the glory of man. Mm. I, you know, I just, I hope that at some point Steve Furtick can, can come down a little bit and understand that. He's built something, but he hasn't built what he's built. And, and I, at some point, I hope God humbles him to the point mm. that he, this is bad for me to say as an elder, I guess, but I want to see him fail so God can actually bring him back and do something good with him. Kind of like Paul, right? Right, right, you, right. You build yourself up and you think you're something great. Yeah. But at some point, you need to be torn back down because you're not great. And, 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 and I have to look at myself with that, too. You yeah, know, all of us have to look at ourselves. Yeah. Um, just one last comment, and, and we've all kind of mentioned it, but the true way to combat all of that entertainment and what have you and pride and what have you is uh, truth. Truth. And, you know, I'll give you more examples of that next week. Well, actually, I'm not here next week. Uh, Gilbert is doing the class next week. I'm going to be visiting some grandbabies. So... We'll see you the week after that.